Hi everyone. Today in this video we are going to discuss how to remember drug names by using drug suffixes in easy way. Drug suffix can give you the information like they can indicate the mechanism of action of the drug. Otherwise they can indicate the chemical category and even they can indicate the clinical category. So when we remember the drug suffixes, we can easily remember the drugs and their chemical categories. And sometimes we can also remember their mechanism of action. In our previous video, we have already discussed the 40 types of unique drug suffixes by which we can remember the drug names very easily. And today in this video, we are going to discuss the remaining types of drug suffixes and what are the drugs in the particular category and how they are going to act. So let's go one by one. First one is the actant. The suffix actant indicates they are the lung surfactants. So we have few other drugs like the calfactant, calfactant is a lung surfactant extracted from the calf lungs. Similarly, synthetic lung surfactants like the baractant, poractant, all these are having the suffix actant, which indicates they are the surfactants. These three types of drugs are having a mixture of phosphoproteins and in the lungs, one of the important phosphoprotein is the dipalmitoyl phosphatidylcholine. This component is acting like a lung surfactant and it reduces the surface tension within the alveolar cells which is required for the filling as well as emptying of the air within the alveolar cells. So for the normal function of the bronchioles, the lung surfactant is required. But in the newborns, we can observe one of the syndrome, the respiratory distress syndrome. In this syndrome, we can observe the deficiency of the lung surfactants as the lungs of the newborn is not completely developed. In such situation, we have to give the lung surfactants externally in order to maintain the function of the bronchioles. So here we are going to use the lung surfactants which are ending with the suffix actant. Second one is the emivir. Emivir indicates they are the neuraminidase inhibitors. In this suffix, the first three letters AMI indicates they are targeting the neuraminidase. So these drugs are the neuraminidase inhibitors and since they are antivirals, we can indicate this with suffix vir. So ME plus vir, it becomes emivir. So drugs having the suffix emivir are acting like antiviral agents by inhibition of the neuraminidase enzyme. So we have two drugs in this category, oseltamivir as well as genamivir. These two drugs can be used in the treatment of influenza A as well as influenza B infections. And oseltamivir is one of the drugs which is given by the oral route. On the other hand, genamavir is given by inhalation route. You can easily remember oseltamavir O for the oral route. How these two drugs are acting? These two drugs are going to inhibit the neuraminidase enzyme. What is the function of this neuraminidase enzyme? After the replication, the viral cells are going to be coming out of the host cell. And at this process, they can bind to one of the target site which is present outside of the cell. And this is made up of the sialic acid. And once this viral cell is going to bind to the sialic acid site, they cannot be released completely. Then the viral cell can release one of the enzyme, neuraminidase enzyme. This enzyme can cleave the binding so that the virion is going to be released. Now whenever this viral cell is going outside of the host cell, it can bind to the sialic acid site. And then this neuraminidase can cleave the site so that it, the virion can be released. In this way, the virions can be released from the host cell by the action of the neuraminidase. But here these drugs like the oseltamivir and genamavir can inhibit this neuraminidase enzyme so that this virion cannot be released from the host cell. In this way, these drugs are going to inhibit the release of the new virions from the host cell. And particularly, these two drugs are useful in the treatment of influenza A as well as influenza B infections. Third one is the Aron. Aron indicates they are the class 3 antiarrhythmic agents. We have the two drugs like the Amiodarone and Dronidarone. Still we have other class 3 antiarrhythmic agents which are having the different suffix. But these two drugs like the Amiodarone and Dronidarone are the class 3 antiarrhythmic agents which are acting by blocking the voltage gated potassium channels. These potassium channels are going to be opened in the phase 3 of repolarization which is blocked by these drugs. In this way, these drugs can delay the repolarization, thereby they can decrease the rate of contraction. But at the same time, by blocking the phase 3, they can prolong the phase 2, that is the plateau phase, in which the calcium can more enter into the cardiac cells. In this way, these drugs can increase the intracellular calcium levels, 
and they may precipitate the arrhythmias. That's why these drugs are called as proarrhythmic agents. Whenever these drugs are used, we can observe an, an increase in the QT interval within the ECG, which indicates they are proarrhythmic in nature. And these drugs can precipitate one of the fatal cardiac arrhythmias, torse depointes. So these drugs should be carefully given in the cardiac patients and the ECG should be thoroughly checked in order to prevent the torse depointes. Fourth one is the SVIR. SVIR indicates they are the protease inhibitors. So we have drugs like the Lidipasvir, Elbasvir, Ombitasvir, Daclatasvir. All these are the drugs ending with the suffix SVIR which indicates they are the protease inhibitors. How these drugs are going to act? These drugs are going to acting on the protease enzyme which is acting on the viral polypeptide. Viral polypeptide is made up of different amino acid which should be cleaved at a particular portion in order to release a, a specific protein. So here in the hepatitis C virus we can observe one type of protease that is the NS5A. This NS5A protease can cleave this viral polypeptide such that it can release one of the specific protein. In this way, the viral polypeptide can release the proteins by action of the protease enzyme. Protease enzyme will cause the proteolysis. It cleaves the peptide bond. Now here these drugs are going to block this release of the viral protein from the viral polypeptide by inhibition of the protease enzyme. And since they are going to inhibit the protease enzyme which is the NS5A, we can observe within the suffix the first letter is A, which indicates they are inhibiting the one of the protease enzyme type A, NS5A. So these drugs are useful in the treatment of hepatitis C infection. Fifth one is the atadine. So atadine indicates they are the tricyclic antihistamines. So we have few other drugs like the loratadine, rupatadine and volopatadine. All these are the tricyclic antihistamines. These drugs are going to block the H1 receptors which are responsible for the allergic as well as inflammatory response. So by blocking these receptors, they can decrease the allergy. That's why these drugs can be used in the treatment of hay fever as well as conjunctivitis. Particularly, these drugs are second generation antihistamines, which are having the less sedation. Sixth one is the Bactam. Bactam indicates they are the penicillinase inhibitors. We have the drugs like the Sulbactam and Tazobactam. These two are the type 2 penicillinase inhibitors. We have type 1 is a clavulanic acid, but the Bactams are the type 2 penicillinase inhibitors. How these drugs are acting? These drugs alone are not effective as an antibacterials, but these drugs can be combined with the other drugs like the ampicillin, piperacillin and so many types of penicillin antibiotics. Because these penicillin antibiotics are converted into inactive metabolites by one of the enzymes, penicillinases. These penicillinases are having the beta-lactamase activity which cleaves the beta-lactam ring thereby they render the drugs as inactive metabolites. Now here the sulbactam and tazobactam can inhibit the penicillinase enzyme thereby they can inhibit the metabolism of the penicillins. That's why these drugs are combined with these penicillins. We have one of the combination like the ampicillin plus sulbactam, similarly piperacillin plus tazobactam and this combination can increase the clinical efficacy of the penicillins. Seventh one is the butazone. Butazone indicates they are the NSAIDs belonging to the phenylbutazone category. So we have two drugs here, phenylbutazone as well as oxyphenbutazone. These two drugs are going to inhibit the COX enzyme, cyclooxygenase enzyme, thereby they inhibit the prostaglandin synthesis. Prostaglandins are mainly responsible for the increase the pain sensation as well as inflammation. So these drugs can be used as analgesics as well as the anti-inflammatory agents. Next one is the Buvir. Buvir indicates again they are the protease inhibitors. So already we have seen one type of protease inhibitors ending with the suffix Svir and here this is the second suffix Buvir. So we have two drugs like the Sophos Buvir and Dasa Buvir. Again these drugs are going to acting on the protease enzyme but this time they are going to acting on a different protease which is nothing but the NS5B. Since the protease is ending with the letter B we can see the suffix starting with the letter B. So NS5A they will have the suffix S where which, which is starting with the letter A and NS5B they are having the suffix Buvir which is starting with the letter B. Now again this uh, NS5B is responsible for the cleavage of the viral peptide to release one type of uh, proteins 
but these drugs are going to inhibit this cleavage and release of the protein thereby they can inhibit the viral replication again this ns5b protease is present in the hepatitis c that's why these drugs are useful in the treatment of hepatitis c infection ninth one is the caver caver indicates they are the nrti nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors we have two drugs here the abacavir and anticaver so here the suffix caver is again having the two parts the ca indicates they are the carbocyclic nucleosides because they are the nucleoside analogs Similarly, the VIR indicates they are the antiviral agents. In this way, CAVIRs are the carbocyclic nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. How these drugs are acting? These drugs are acting as an anti-HIV agent and within the HIV cell, we can observe the viral RNA. This viral RNA is going to be come to viral DNA by one of the enzyme, reverse transcriptase enzyme. This enzyme can travel along with the viral RNA so that it can convert this viral RNA into the viral DNA. So this is the reverse transcription where the DNA is going to be prepared from the RNA. But here the caver drugs are the nucleoside analogs so they can compete with the other nucleosides for the reverse transcriptase enzyme. So they are going to bind to this reverse transcriptase enzyme thereby inhibit the enzymatic activity. In this way the cavers can decrease the viral replication by inhibition of the reverse transcriptase enzyme. And these two drugs are used in the treatment of HIV infection. But here, abacavir is one of the drugs which should be carefully given in the patients because of the hypersensitive reactions. Since it can produce a very severe hypersensitive reactions which are fatal to the patient, before the administration of this drug, the HLA gene test should be done in order to assess any hypersensitive reactions produced by this drug. Tenth one is the silin. Silin indicates they are the Penicillin derivatives, we have a lot of drugs ending with the suffix silin, methicillin, cloxacillin, which are the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. Similarly, ampicillin and amoxicillin, which are the extended spectrum penicillins. And carbenicillin, ticarcillin, piperacillin, which are the anti-pseudomonal penicillins. In this way, all these types of drugs are ending with the suffix silin, which indicates they are the penicillin derivatives. How these drugs are going to act? All the penicillins are going to act on the cell wall since of the bacteria. Within the cell wall of the bacteria, we can observe two building blocks. One is the N-acetyl muramic acid, which is indicated by the block M. And another one is the N-acetyl glucosamine, which is here indicated with the G. Now the muramic acid is having a tetrapeptide chain. And the two layers of the muramic acid can be cross-linked with a pentapeptide glycine residue. So within the cell wall senses, the cross-linking of the peptidoglycan layers is very important, which is going to be blocked by penicillin derivatives. In this way, penicillins can inhibit the cell wall senses in the bacteria, thereby they can produce a bactericidal action. Eleventh one is the COXIP. COXIP indicates they are the selective COX2 inhibitors. So we have the drugs like the silicoxib, paricoxib, valdicoxib and etoricoxib. All these are the selective COX-2 inhibitors. So these drugs are going to acting on the COX enzyme, but this COX enzyme is of two types, COX-1 as well as COX-2. COX-1 is the constitutive enzyme which is always present in the plasma, but COX-2 enzyme is the inducible form of the enzyme. So this enzyme is going to be induced during the inflammatory response, which is responsible for the sense of the prostaglandins as well as the thromboxanes. Thereby it can increase the nociception, the pain sensation, as well as the inflammation. So in order to inhibit the prostaglandin senses, we have to selectively block the COX-2 enzyme. But NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are non-selective. They can block both COX-1 as well as COX-2 enzyme, which may result if you have the side effects like the gastric ulceration. But here these cox drugs are selectively inhibiting the COX-2 enzyme. Thereby, they are going to decrease the prostaglandin senses at the inflammatory site only. Even these drugs are selected for the COX-2 enzyme, but still these drugs can increase some cardiovascular side effects, so they should be carefully given in the patients. Twelfth one is the curium. Curium indicates are the curare derivatives. Curare alkaloids are the natural alkaloids, which are going to produce one of the drugs, d tubocurarin This d tubocurarin is acting like a neuromuscular blocker. And from this 
Dichubocurarin, we can have few of the synthetic analogs like the atracurium, cisatracurium, and mevacurium. All these are the derivatives of the curare alkylides. That's why these drugs are acting like non depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. Just similar to the Dichubocurarin, these drugs are going to act at the neuromuscular junction and they can have two important sites. These drugs can bind to the postsynaptic nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are inotropic receptors. By blocking these receptors, they can block the entry of the sodium and depolation within the muscle. At the same time, these drugs can also act on the presynaptic nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are auto-stimulatory in nature. By blocking these receptors, they decrease the release of the acetylcholine. In this way, the curium compounds can act by postsynaptically as well as presynaptically, thereby they produce the muscle paralysis. Thirteenth one is the DOPA. DOPA indicates that the dopamine precursors. We have two drugs like the levodopa and carbidopa. These two drugs can be used in the treatment of Parkinson disease, where the levodopa alone can be used, but the carbidopa should be combined with the levodopa. These drugs are acting like dopamine precursors. For example, when we administer the levodopa, it can cross the blood-brain barrier and it can enter into the CNS. Within the CNS, it can be converted into dopamine. For this, one of the enzymes is present that is the DDC, DOPA decarboxylase enzyme, which is going to cleave the carboxylic acid so that the levodopa is converted into dopamine. Now this DDC is going to acting on the levodopa such that this carboxylic acid group is going to be removed and this is going to be converted into dopamine. In this way, the dopamine levels can be increased within the CNS by administration of the levodopa. But this drug is having one of the limitations that when we administer the levodopa, it can be metabolized by the peripheral dopa decarboxylase enzyme. This peripheral DDC can act on the levodopa such that it can be converted to dopamine within the periphery. But this dopamine cannot enter into the CNS. In this way, the levodopa is converted to dopamine within the periphery, which decreases the entry of the levodopa into the CNS. In order to inhibit this, we can use the carbidopa. Carbidopa is going to inhibit the peripheral DDC enzyme. That's why carbidopa can be combined with the levodopa and this combination can be given in a ratio of 4 is to 1 or 10 is to 1. That is 4 parts of levodopa and 1 part of carbidopa. Otherwise 10 parts of levodopa with the 1 parts of the carbidopa. 14th one is the fentanyl. Fentanyl indicates that the enilinopiperidines, these are the opioid drugs. We have the drugs like the alfentanyl, sufentanyl and remifentanyl. These drugs are going to acting on the OPI receptors like the mu receptors, kappa receptors or delta receptors. So they can produce analgesia at the central, spinal as well as the peripheral levels. And particularly these drugs are having the high lipophilicity which results in the high potency. So among the opioids, the fentanyl class of drugs are having the high potency and they are having the high affinity for the mu receptors. 15th one is a fibrate. The suffix fibrate indicates they are the anti-hyperlipid mix which are acting like PPAR gamma activators. PPAR is nothing but the peroxone proliferator activated receptor. These are the nuclear receptors on which the fibrates can act. So the drugs ending with the suffix fibrate include the clofibrate and phenofibrate. These drugs are going to acting on the PPR gamma receptors, thereby they activate these receptors, which are the nuclear receptors, which then undergo the gene transcription and protein synthesis. One of the protein they are going to synthesize is the lipoprotein lipase enzyme, which can cleave the triglycerides into the free fatty acids. Triglycerides are rich in the VLDL. Now this lipoprotein lipase can act on the VLDL where it can cleave the triglycerides into the free fatty acids and glycerin molecules. In this way, triglycerides are converted to free fatty acids by the lipoprotein lipase enzyme. So these fibrate drugs can decrease the VLDL levels as well as the triglyceride levels. That's why they are used as anti-hyperlipidemics. And they also have minor action on the LDL and HDL levels. They can slightly decrease the LDL levels and increase the HDL levels.